Ledbury. Um, it's really lovely to be here. I'm absolutely delighted to be reading with a superb poet um, like Miss Berry. It's just such a delight to be reading with a fellow Midlander as well. And a huge thank you to Bloodax and to Neil Astley um, for their support of my poetry and for publishing Assembly Lines. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a poem called Midland's Kids. Midland's Kids. We were raised in cars, grew up on the back seats of the long gone marks of British manufacturing, Morris, Austins and Talbots, slightly crap, even new. Third or fourth hand, pockmarked, and in summer, distinguished by the waft of hot leatherette, the oil black tang of the four star fumes and the rust red frothing of a hadded head gasket that had sent the radiator broiling over. Those people we once thought to be them, misplaced down the gap in the back seat that so ingeniously folded forward, or left tucked like secrets in the chrome pop-out passenger ashtrays, just as each promised holiday a magical mystery tour silvered in the wing mirrors before momentarily vanishing far out on the hot horizon, like the car plants, the company overalls, the jobs for life, the legendary square steering wheel of a paint shop fresh allegro. We're going to stay with childhood for a moment and we're going to go back to school. This poem um, is called National Curriculum and it's split up into various subjects so I'm going to read you the first of those. This is history. At the revisionist tea party we're invited to the crumbs from the tablecloth of in industrial empire death by numbers. War is an onslaught of terrible mathematics. Full-page diagrams in pastel shades formulate how many former students sleep in a foreign field that is forever. Sculptors forge a new iron repose of the tourist age to be mass-produced for the national mantelpiece out of iron railings and working-class saucepans. The miners' strike becomes a picnic with the police on the village green illustrated by time-lapse pictures of coniferous coal lurking subterranean in a virgin sea. Maps become useless. Someone tows the whole collection of British Isles further out into the Atlantic and cuts it adrift. Sand. It began when you opened your desk and found everything gone, replaced with sand. You open the wooden pencil case your brother had made and it contained nothing but sand. Next, your books filled with sand and the words began to wear away. Your homework was late because sand ate the sums and solutions. Study time vanished into the time it had taken to dig sand from the library shelves like an archeologist before you could find the reference books. When you were sent to fetch the register, the secretary poured sand into your open hands. At detention, you wrote out a hundred times, I must not lose the sand register on the way back to class. When you opened the door to the classroom, a dune of sand poured out and it was impossible to climb up. The taps in the toilets only gave you sand, cold, pale sand. Your running shoes filled with sand and the sand got between your toes and blistered your feet. Sand followed you home, waited at the bus stop, filled the back seat of the coach and slid down the aisle when the driver braked harshly. Sand lurked through the weekends, bank holidays, every day of the half-term break. Sand accumulated on Sunday evenings and came down on you in a storm after tea, filled your sheets with a million tiny silica jibes, made it impossible to sleep and got into your dreams. Even there, when the other children laughed, the sand blasted your face and clogged your throat. The Shop Floor Gospel Angry, he who trudges the grey, dog-eared estate avenues, a rasp of, I bloody told you so, on their lips. Fortune teller, free agent, Laughter in grubby canteens. Mark my words, we're a living museum. There's no future, we're sold, sold 
out. Decades, blowing a coarse wind through the resistance where no borders were left to cross, no other line to join, only holding out against some kind of new that pacified the absences with retail parks. You are the lone no on the shop floor, the habitual reader of all the wrong news, the public library ghost, the vote cast for some old school that's long since closed, a vanished oddment, a piss in the wind, the autumn leaves laughing at a glib historian's reworking of the ladies not for turning. I bloody told you so. <laughs> when I was staying here um, in the summer of 2016, and it was a very strange summer. I came to Ledbury and felt, after several weeks, you know, sort of, I think it had been, it was actually seven days um, after the Brexit vote that I came here. And it was sort of a, a, a relief to come to Ledbury and sort of connect again with the world slightly because I felt like I'd been living in a parallel universe for the week that had followed. And from that kind of sense of, of where we were, this poem um, came, came about. I'm just going to have a small drink of water because it's quite a long poem as well. And when I was starting to write this poem, I started to think a little bit about how I would approach it. Um, and from my notes and from a few bits of language as well, some in old English, um, I really felt that that would be a good approach into this poem. So the two words I need to tell you about, and um, one is hlaufera, which means a shelter feather, to put a protective arm around somebody. The other is the title of the poem itself, Unweather, which comes from the Old English, meaning literally storm or unweather. 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 One. There will be nights like this. When under the dark sky's heavy knife, the dog comes to your heel and you both stare far off into the fathomless middle distance of 3 a.m. And there will be mornings like this too, when dread moves in you like botulism, as the little island tilts on its foundations, threatens to tip you and the seasick dog loose. Lone along the burning ledge as the longshore drift carries a crumbling biscuit nation off to sea. And you'll have nothing but the words of an old song on your lips, the bones of a last meal to pick through, the ashes, ashes everywhere. Two, we need a new word for the name of the country I woke up in this morning. We need a new word for the theft of something indefinable but definitely lifted. We need a new word with which to curse the salesman of a shoddy nightmare. We need a new word for the sense of betrayal that smashes the pedestals of household gods. We need a new word for how we navigate conversations, feeling our way in to work out where the fractures lie. We need a new word for a nation that doesn't exist. We need a new word for how the bigotry in the mortar became the bricks and stones and broken windows. We need a new word for walking the grey streets of each new day with a mouthful of lime and ashes. We need a new word for the uncertainty of loss. We need a new word for regret. We need a new word for the new bad news. We need a new word for the ugliness of our new words. For shame, we need a new word for the shame. We need a new word for the fear. Three. Our tongues were made from sprechen, <coughs> dicere, parle, mackle together with flints and flaps of leather, wolf pelt, sheepskin, grown greenly fat in the sun, pressed, stoppered in amphora and bartered, molten to lead in the crucible, and poured into typeface punches, licked onto vellum, all carried in language's little sailboat. My tongue might have said larish, where now it says speak. Each leaf of English borrowed from a starry European library of tongues, library card now revoked, and the tongues rabbling and clattering through vowel and dialect and regional collateral, like wonderful mongrels escaped from the pound, never to be returned. Gifts we must carry behind our teeth, a chlau feather to drape on a fellow traveller's shoulders. Four, I want to take what my neighbour has. I want to take the car he has on his drive, which is newer than the car on my drive. I want to take the crockery and the food and the cool beer from his table. 
I want to take his workaday whistling on a frosty morning. I want to take the quiet pride of his smiling family, his carefree son, kicking the football, switching lightly from left to right, with the same easy slips between one language and another. I want to piss a stream of rural Britannia over their flower beds. I want to wave my flag, tell them they're not welcome, grind our differences into their face, pack their bags, send them back. I want a sepia empire with a post-truth currency. I want to scrub the star from the union, take down the blue from their sky. Five. I lost my country for the promises on a big red bus. I lost my country when somebody left the handbrake off and it rolled away downhill. I lost my country after it's recalled due to a manufacturing fault and then burst into flames. I lost my country to stop someone else enjoying it. I lost my country to a failure of the left, to an offshore account. I lost my country in the food bank queue on the playing fields of Eton. has been um, simply one of the most damaging things um, in the last decade um, to society and the way that we have treated um, people and put so many people into extreme poverty um, and particularly hunger and um, for children to not have food um, I think is really appalling. Um, this poem um, was written in response to a friend of mine who um, was out of work and was asked to work for free, sorting dirty rags, um, which I thought was um, appalling, Victorian, um, shameful. Um, and I kind of thought about our responses and, and what responses we have to some of these things, and my own complicated answer um, to this as well. Um, so this poem is called Shrug. Nothing happened for years. The concept of opposition clearly outmoded and uncouth. Automated text proclaimed, become a limb in our service economy. Opportunities for electronic serfdom in all sectors of our growing waste paper empire. Reports revealed how plucky strivers sought soiled rags for the workfare team. The shrug became our national salute. In small scandals of stolen littered lives, or en masse, the poorest slandered. The doorsteps of the status quo swept clean. We slumped at the headlines and hoopla and shrugged. Gone viral, even our selfies betrayed us. Looking inward at ourselves, infinite, at our own what to be done, unable to bite the hand that fed us our national daily dish of lies. Such cold, damnable lies. And that poem was also um, partly written with the Hillsborough tragedy and, um, and uh, things like all grief in mind as well. Um, I'm really sad to kind of have that great part to that list as well. Not all of my poems are political. Um, I do write a lot about the Midlands and about place. I also um, find myself writing about animals in various ways as well. Um, so this poem is called Dog, on first being named. They're wrong, of course, our owners who think they own us. Choice, an illusion out of their hands, quicker than a quicksilver whippet out the traps. But the name at least, and this two-syllable moniker, and the telephone manner with which you deliver it, is yours to give, a password for recall bringing me to heal and to your hands peace offering, rubber nosing your scent to sniff out all the trails of your laughter and grievings, of daffodils and thunder, the wreck's muddy turf, thawing snow. From this first it's your voice that cracks instinct, unlocks obedience, echoes through each leg-twitching dream, pursued across each field, you naming our bond my wordless joy. 
Later, you teach the code words for how I must ask, lie, play dead. But it's my name I'll chase down, hounding to your cry in long, over on pitch of all the dog days to come. I'll leave that one for um, Liz Berry. Um, I remember reading it in a workshop group um, and Liz and I both share um, a great love of animals and particularly of small terriers. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and I'd like to finish by coming back to the Midlands, I think. And coming back to place, it's formed such a big part of um, these poems. And the Midlands have been, it, to paraphrase Roy Fisher a little, um, they have been what I think with when I'm writing quite often. And I find so much within this landscape that inspires me, um, particularly my birth city of Coventry, which I'm very proud to see as when the City Culture 2021, I hope it brings it lots of brilliant things. Um, I'm going to finish with this poem, um, and it has a little um, epigraph at the beginning, which is from a play um, at the Belgrave Theatre in Coventry called One Night in November, and the epigraph is, you know, Wordsworth said of Coventry, it was one of the most beautiful cities in all of England. It is a pity, a great pity. <laughs> I always used to think that's quite sad, but audiences always chuckle at that, so it kind of makes me feel a little better about it. Coventry is. Always the bridesmaid, and never the bride, is somewhere to be sent, where you come to find your train of thoughts and miss the last train home, where things come to an end, and the opening paragraph is rewritten, then lost, then bodged, where hope is exchanged for something a little less brash, like maybe or perhaps. An ugly, beautiful place that seeks someone to love it back, misses the letters you used to write and wishes you would call, preferring not to talk tonight of the masses buried at London Road, the dead car plants, assembly lines, Rarely loved, much maligned, occasionally extramarital, a clandestine affair. Too old and worn out for that kind of funny business. Disgusted, outraged at the suggestion, and only needs a good architect to get rid of the dark roots. Wants you to know she didn't always look this way. Is going to raise a little soul and get herself back on that bloody horse. <laughs>